So Mark chapter 16, if you're there, we'll begin reading uh, in verse 1. It says, And when the Sabbath was passed, Mary Magdalene and Mary the mother of James and Salome had bought sweet spices that they might come and anoint him. And very early in the morning, the first day of the week, they came unto the sepulcher at the rising of the sun, and they said among themselves, Who shall roll us away the stone from the door of the sepulcher? And when they looked, they saw that the stone was rolled away, for it was very great. And entering into the sepulcher, they saw a young man sitting on the right side, clothed and in a long white garment, and they were affrighted. And he said unto them, Be not afraid, you seek Jesus of Nazareth, which was crucified. He is risen, he is not here. <laughs> uh, typically, that's a place where most believers shout, dance, run, because Jesus isn't in that tomb anymore. There we go, we're alive tonight. He is not here, he is risen. Thank God, thank God that he is risen. Behold the place where they laid him. But go your way, tell his disciples and Peter that he goes before you into Galilee. There shall you see him as he said unto you. And they went quickly and fled from the sepulcher, for they trembled and were amazed. Neither said they anything to any man, for they were afraid. And skip down to verse 15 with me. Verse 15. And he said unto them, Go ye into the world and preach the gospel to every creature. Go ye into the world and preach the gospel to every creature. This is not something that Jesus has stopped saying. He is currently looking on us here in Crossfire. He's currently looking on the body of Christ and he is saying, go ye into the world and preach the gospel to every creature. There is a world out there that needs to hear. There is a world out there that needs to know. We are in great need of seeing a move of God. And we need the gospel of Jesus Christ to be preached. And in order for us to see that move of God, we've got to have a time of corporate prayer. And then we got to go. We got to go and tell this world that he's alive. He that believes and is baptized shall be saved. But he that believes not shall be condemned. And these things shall follow them that believe. In my name shall they cast out devils. They will speak with new tongues. They take up serpents. And if they drink any deadly thing, it shall not hurt them. They shall lay hands on the sick and they shall recover. I want to preach a message to you tonight entitled Proof and Hope. Preach a message to you tonight entitled Proof and Hope. Heavenly Father, we come to you tonight in the name of your son, Jesus. And Lord, we just thank you for this opportunity that we have, Lord, to minister your word. Lord, we thank you for what you're doing in Crossfire Youth Ministries, Lord, and all that you plan to do moving forward. Lord, we're just asking tonight that your spirit would be with us, Father, that your anointing would be with us. Lord, that you would come and anoint me to preach, anoint me to teach. And Lord, I'm asking tonight that those of us, those who are here in this audience, Lord, those who are watching by television, listening by radio, or watching by the internet, Father, what we're asking for is that you would give us a spirit of wisdom, and you would give us a spirit of revelation in the knowledge of the Lord Jesus Christ, that we would know the hope of his calling, that we would know the glory of his riches of the inheritance in the saints, and Lord, that we would know this great power that has been directed to those of us who believe, and Father, we will not stop short of giving you all of the glory for it tonight. In Jesus' name we pray, amen. amen and amen. There was a young investigative journalist who uh, was making headway in the world of journalism. Um, most of you have probably heard him, and you've probably heard of his testimony. His name is Lee Strobel. He was an atheist. He did not believe that there was a God, not just agnostic where you, there could be a God and I don't know if I can find him. The idea is that the, for atheism, there is absolutely no God. His wife was what you would consider agnostic. There is probably a God. I just don't know how we can know him or how we can find him. Um, and he was a very angry man. man. I mean, he was making headway, guys. He was uh, winning awards. He was doing great things. I mean, he was... Um, at the top of his game, but of, it, of his own admission, he was a miserable human being. And he absolutely hated life. He was a drunk. He, um, he uh, would come home and have arguments with his wife. He said that the greatest, um, the greatest condemnation against his life 
was that when he would come home, his daughter would be playing in the living room, and as he walks through the doorway, she would pick up all of her toys and walk out of the room and go to her room. She did not want to be around him. I mean, making a name for himself, very popular, very prominent, very successful, but a very angry, miserable, and bitter man who did not believe that there could be a God at all. (laughs) And this man... Uh, his wife, who was experiencing arguments and was scared at times because of his drunkenness and the way he would come home and be violent and angry, um, I don't know that he ever beat her, but um, was definitely abusive with his language and abusive with his attitude. And she met a Christian woman who started talking to her about Jesus. And eventually, his wife gave her heart and life to Jesus Christ. She even convinced him on one occasion. He said the very first thing, the very first word that went through his mind when he found out that she had accepted Jesus Christ was divorce. He wanted nothing to do with this. He wanted nothing to do with that life. Wanted nothing to do with someone who might become a holy roller. Um, I'll take a holy roller over an angry drunk any day. Um, Anyway. Um, And he wanted nothing to do with this life. She convinced him to go to a church service, and he sat down, and for the very first time that he said he could recall, he heard the gospel of Jesus Christ preached for the very first time. And as he was sitting there, he began to think, you know what? I'm really good at what I do. I'm an extremely good investigative journalist. I'm not only good at it, I'm the editor of the paper. I'm great at it. I'm very skeptical. And I know that if Christianity hangs its hat on the resurrection of Jesus Christ, then I know how to get my wife out of this mess. I'll investigate it, and I'll disprove it. See, that's, you don't just have a guy that's jumping into the stream of investigation just to investigate from a biased standpoint. you got a guy who's ready to prove, it, prove that it does not exist, that it is not true, it is not real. That's a bias. And he, in, he enters into this investigation, and he starts to lay out all of the evidence. And as he begins to investigate over the course of the next two years to save his wife from this chaotic religion called Christianity, he said that he came across a couple of things that made it a little bit difficult for him to disprove what was happening. He said he came up actually with four words throughout the course of this two-year investigation that did not disprove the resurrection, but validated it. It's not what he sought to accomplish, but it's what ended up happening as he looked at the data. He said the first word that he came up with, execution. Jesus clearly died. There is no question about it. Internal sources within the Bible itself claimed that Jesus Christ died. External resources outside of the Bible claimed that Jesus Christ died. There was no question. Jesus was crucified by the Romans and he died. Historically, see, some people say, how do you know that Jesus is real? That's not even a question. He existed. This is historically documented and validated not only in the Bible, but outside of the Bible. There's no question as to whether or not he existed. The question is, all the claims that he made, are they true? See, that's the true question that needs to be answered. And one of the things that cannot be be denied historically is that Jesus lived and Jesus died and at the hands of a Roman crucifixion. There is no question of it. Execution. And then he said the next word was early, early accounts. He said early accounts concluded that Jesus rose from the dead. We have a a report of the resurrection from a creed of the earliest Christian church, um, which Paul wrote in one of his letters. That's 20 years outside of the event that took place. He said it's rare to have someone documenting an event so close historically. Early accounts. He said, but that creed is something that Paul quoted that already existed in Christianity. Uh, there's a particular scholar who is an expert on these matters, and he said, we can, get, we can be sure that within just a couple of months of the event of the crucifixion and the resurrection, Christianity started to use this particular creed. And it was this, Jesus Christ died for our sins, and he rose from the dead. So Christians, people in history, were already starting to make claims that Jesus Christ, soon after his death, rose again from the dead. This wasn't something that was invented a couple of centuries later, and that's what Lee Strobel thought he was going to find. 
He said, I'm sure somewhere about 150 years a legend would have developed and we've got the idea that Jesus has risen from the dead. It would just have been made up. And um, he said that he asked a particular scholar, he said, how long does it take for a legend to actually begin? A legend is something that didn't actually happen. It's not historical. He said it takes at least two generations for a legend to develop. So the idea that a legend was developing within a couple of months after the resurrection of Christ, or even 20 years after the resurrection of Christ, would not have been possible because it was too close to the actual historical reality. It's a big thought there. It would have been impossible for such a broad group of people to accept that Jesus rose from the dead had it happened just a hundred or two hundred years later, they started to talk about it. Then we might have some questions about its reality. So, but since it was so close to the event, it's hard to deny its historical reliability. So early, early accounts started to validate that Jesus had truly risen from the dead. And he said, here was the next one. Empty tomb. Empty tomb. And look, it's not even just Jesus' disciples that are claiming the tomb is empty. When they start coming to the Pharisees and the Sadducees and the religious leaders, they say, oh yeah, the tomb's empty. That's because the disciples went and stole the body. They did not deny the reality of the empty tomb. The tomb was empty. He said, so historically, now we have to deal with the fact that, and he said, that's just your base cover story. It's like, you don't know what to say. The tomb's empty. You're not even trying to deny it. So the fact that Jesus died, was buried, and that people started to talk about it soon, and we've got to deal with the fact that there is legitimately an empty tomb from where he was laid. And he said the final word that came was eyewitnesses. Eyewitnesses. Over a period of time, Jesus began to reveal himself to men, to women, to disciples, to fearful men, to doubters, to unbelievers and to believers. He appeared to his own brother who did not believe. He appeared to believers, those who did believe but just didn't know what was going on. So you have all of this evidence, and he said, at the end of my investigation, with all of this avalanche of evidence before me that Jesus has truly risen From the dead, he said, there was only one conclusion I could come to, that the historical reality of Christianity is true. Jesus truly did die. Jesus truly was buried. And he truly did rise from the dead. He said, but this did not save me. Because it couldn't. See, because now he would have to look at this information and say, if he died and he rose from the dead then every single claim he made about himself has to have been true. Because he said that he would die and rise again, definitely the most impossible task to accomplish. And if he were able to do that, think a little bit. If he were able to pull that off, then everything that he said about himself must be a reality. Jesus is exactly who he says he is. He did not lie about himself. He did not make something up. He was not just a holy man. He was not just a religious man. He wasn't just a faith healer. He's the son of the living God. (laughs) And he said, I've come to take away the sin of the world. He's who he says he is. History validates it. The greatest, one of the greatest investigative journalists in history has looked at the information and come as an atheist who wanted to disprove it and says, oh my God, it's real. And he believed it and he was born again and he is now saved today. What a phenomenal story. He is who he says he is. John, uh, John, Sean. <laughs> Sean preached a message on this not long ago in Family Worship Center, and he talked about a particular defense attorney, right? Defense attorney, one of the greatest in all of, uh, in in history, as I remember. And he went out to set up a defense about this whole idea of the resurrection, and he came to the same conclusion. It is true, and it can be defended. 
When people set out to look into the reality, an honest approach as to whether or not Jesus is who he says he is, the evidence is overwhelming. It cannot be denied. Not to mention the Holy Spirit added into the mix as he begins to convict and as he begins to deal with people. And I want to look at this, and I want you to think about this. As we get to the end of our study on the Gospel of Mark, everything that Jesus has said up until this point must be viewed as though it were coming from God Himself. Everything that we have heard about Him, everything that we have read about Him, everything that we've been taught about Him, we have to view it as not just coming from a man, but coming from God Himself. Everything he has said has now been validated by the resurrection. It's all true. And remember, the entire point of the Gospel of Mark is to present Jesus as the mighty, suffering Messiah and the Son of God who will accomplish this great deliverance for Israel and for the whole world, really, not by means of political or militaristic might, or prestige, but what he will do will be accomplished by traveling down a path of suffering. Not a path of ease, not a path of great political prowess, not a path of great militaristic campaign. He has not come to deliver Israel from Roman occupation. He has come, he has come to deliver humanity from the occupation of sin, from the occupation of death, from the occupation of Satan himself, that you and I might be free to walk in liberty and the victory that Jesus Christ gives. Everything that he said about himself has now got to be viewed as valid because he rose from the dead. The resurrection is the evidence that Jesus is who he said he is and that he requires of us, again, another point to Mark, He's not just writing to tell you about Jesus. He's writing that your life would be changed because of what he's telling you about Jesus. And he's calling his disciples. Remember the triad from uh, chapter 8, chapter 9, and chapter 10. Three times Jesus tells the disciples that he, must, that he must die. And they are confused about it. And he tells them, not only must I die, but you're going to have to follow me down a path of suffering. You're going to have to take up your cross, deny yourself, and follow after me. And you're going to have to do this every day. So he's not just, not just what he said of himself is valid, but what he said of humanity is valid. That humanity is lost in sin and in need of a Savior. And that through the path of suffering that he is on, by going by way of Calvary, he will redeem humanity from their sin. This is a reality. But it's not just all this evidence that validates Jesus' claims to have risen. But another thing that you and I need to think about, another thing that you and I need to ponder, is the resurrection life that takes place within the heart and the mind of the individual who accepts Jesus Christ. Y'all have heard me tell this story, who knows how many times, too many times. Not enough times, <laughs> probably not enough times. Eight years ago, hung over in the back of a church, after a night of partying and drinking, uh, in a morning in the church after a night of partying and drinking, white knuckling the pew in front of me, crying out to God because I found myself in a quite miserable state, said, Lord, if you'll deliver me from alcohol and tobacco, I promise to serve you for the rest of my life. And that very moment, Jesus Christ entered into my heart and completely transformed my life. I was not the same man that walked into that church, I was a new man. And I said, deliver me from alcohol, deliver me from tobacco, I'll make you the Lord of my life. Immediately, the desire for those two things were completely gone. I mean, you're talking about a guy who couldn't put it down, is now standing by his trash can and in the bathroom, pouring it all out and throwing it into the trash can. And I did not want it a second after, and I still don't want it today. That's deliverance, my friends. I'm not just resisting it, I don't want it. That's freedom. I'm not bound by it anymore. You can have freedom tonight in Christ. And here I was set free. This, what took place inside of me, 
All right, I went and started reading the Bible and found that Jesus had risen from the dead, and I already knew that. You see, because I met that man eight years ago in that little church. I already knew he had risen from the dead because he entered into that church and he changed my life. I met the risen Savior. I, he touched me. Oh, yes, he touched me. And now I'm no longer the same. Something happened. And now I know Jesus touched me and he made me whole. <laughs> He touched me. I said he touched me. I'll never be the same because Jesus has touched me, changed me, transformed me. I am not. I am not what I used to be. And that experience in Christ validates that Jesus rose from the dead. How do I know that? Because the sin that had me bound when I walked in had to let me go when I called on his name. Woo! It had to let me go because I called on the name of Jesus. It had to let me go because when he died, he didn't just die to rise again. He died to put to death sin and death. And the power of darkness that held its grip on my life. He died <laughs> to end the conflict. And when I called on his name, sin had to let me go. He delivered me from the powers of darkness. He harpizoed me. He translated me. He plucked me up. Translated me. One day, here we are driving along, and Satan is my taskmaster, hitting me with that whip, telling me every direction to go. And then the last thing he hears... Jesus! And I'm gone. Where'd he go? Jesus! He's hearing that all over his kingdom. That's got to drive him crazy, man. And I've been planted into the kingdom of his dear son. I'm not in the same kingdom, I'm not driven by the same authority. I'm not dominated by the same powers. I've been delivered from the law of sin and death. And I now live under the law of the spirit of life in Christ Jesus. The government that reigned over me no longer reigns over me today because I've been translated. I don't belong to that kingdom. I belong to a new kingdom. I'm risen from the dead. The wages of sin are death. You and I, we were dead in trespasses and sin. But the moment that you call upon Jesus, you are translated out of that kingdom, out of that reality. He no longer sees you that way because He baptizes you into Jesus Christ. You are baptized into His death. You are buried with Him by baptism into death. And just as Jesus Christ has risen from the dead, you also should walk in newness of life. You see, that new created man that you and I experience when we come to Jesus, it really does validate the claim that Jesus rose from the dead. The Bible came along and told me what happened, but it already had happened. It validated the thing that took place in me, but it had already happened. See, Jesus rising from the dead is huge because it means he dealt with sin. He said in Mark, he, pro- he, he showed it. But he also stated it, that he had the authority to forgive sins. That's a big deal. He said to that paralytic, he said, look at your faith, your sins be forgiven you. The paralytic came to be healed. He didn't come to have his sins forgiven, he came to be healed. But his faith was what connected to Christ and earned him the, re- the, the reward of having his sins forgiven. And the Pharisees are sitting there wondering, what in the world, who does this man think he is to think that he can actually be equal with God And allow a man to have his sins forgiven. He's not God. Who is this guy? And Jesus, understanding what they're reasoning in their hearts, looks at these men and he says, Is it easier for me to say to this man, your sins be forgiven, or to rise up and walk? And they knew what he meant by that. He did not mean, "Is is one of them harder than the other? What he meant was, and this is going against their theology, and this is why it shut them up. They didn't say a word. If Jesus heals him, then he must have been able to forgive his sins. 
That's their theology. You're sick because you're in sin. That's what they thought about God. And Jesus says, which one's easier? But so that you know. (laughs) I love Christ, man. I love Jesus. But so that all of you here will know that the Son of Man, that's a Messianic title from Daniel chapter 7, verses 13 and 14. I'm the Messiah. So you'll know that the Messiah has the authority to forgive sins. I say to this man, rise up and walk. And what happened? That guy's legs, for the very first time, began to gain some strength. And he stood upright, and he took his bed, and not only walked, but that man ran. That man had a Pentecostal fit, is what that man had, because he had been, he had been risen up from being paralyzed his whole life. Think of this. It wasn't just to heal a man, it was to say, I can forgive sins. If he can forgive sins and he rose from the dead... Validating a claim. He said, I have authority and I have power over sickness. I have authority and I have power over demon spirits. I have authority and I have power over nature. I have authority and I have power over death. As he touched a widow woman's son's casket and that boy stood up. (laughs) He has power. He has authority. And he's making all of these claims. But another thing that we've got to stop and think is what he's telling us. What he's saying to the believer. What is he saying to me? He's saying that my path was a path of suffering. Your path will too be a path of suffering. He said you'd be delivered before courts, before judges, before kings. And you would have to testify of him. Don't be afraid of what you will say in that hour. For in that hour I will give to you what you are to say. You and I are going to walk down a road in Christianity that requires us to lose some things. That old life that I was living, I had to abandon it. I'll never forget Jesus bringing me to another point of of, uh, giving over, of a losing of my life when I uh, had a couple of friends in college who were my brothers. I mean, that's how we viewed each other. And they called me up and they said, bro, I said, we need you to drive us tonight. We're going to go out and uh, we don't have anybody to drive. Can you do it? And I said, man, let me think about it. And in me, the right thing says, you drive them so they don't kill themselves. Because whether or not you drive them, you know they're going. That's how those guys were. They're going whether you drive them or not. And I thought that's the right thing to do. But something inside said it wasn't. I didn't know what to do. Started struggling with this. Called my mother, talked to her about it. Got down and I prayed about it. And I knew what the Lord was telling me. The Lord was telling me, do not drive them to that bar. Do not take part in the lifestyle that they are living. You are not that anymore. And I had to call, that, I had to call them back and say, look guys, I love y'all, but it's just not going to happen. I can't do this can't do it. And I felt so bad while I was on the phone with them. But when I hung up, the presence of God fell all over me. And I felt like I did the morning I got saved. Because you know what was happening? God was delivering me from something that was still binding me. We need some deliverance today. He brought me to this point where I had to deny myself. I had to lose my life. I had to give up. I had to let something go. And if I had to guess, there are some of you in this place tonight, you need to let go of some things that you've been holding on to. Let me say it this way, and those of you who are watching by television, listening by radio, God is not pleased with what you are allowing in your life. He's not pleased. Also, He does not take it lightly. What you are allowing to continue to exist in your life. Do you want to know why God doesn't take it lightly? I want you to take a look at Calvary. I want you to take a look. I want you to think about it. I want to think about it. I want to think about this great price that our Savior paid. He went to Gethsemane and he sweat. Uh, a great drop, so I told you all last week that it wasn't just like a little bit of perspiration. Or perspiration. I'm having a hard time with that one. I'll get it. But it was, 
his blood vessels were breaking and the blood was clotting. And as he continued to agonize in prayer, the blood would push through his pores. Talking about thick, clotted blood drops all over the ground as he stumbles and he staggers from place to place and place to place, asking God to help him to go through with the event of Calvary. And he comes to a place in Gethsemane where he says, Lord, if there's a way, then we, I want to, let's pass this cup to that way. But nevertheless, yes. nevertheless, yes. nevertheless, not my will, but thine be done. And he submitted for who? For me. For me? For us? I know me. I know who I am. I know what I was. I know who I am today. And he submitted to that agonizing death anyway. Oh, glory to God. He committed himself to go to Calvary even though he knew everything that was in me that resisted him, that was obstinate towards him, that was rebellious to him. And he submitted to that painful, excruciating, agonizing death anyway. What a price. What a price. What a price. That's why God hates sin. Because look at the price it would cost to atone for it. The poured out blood, the broken body of his own son. Hear people talking about young people today. You don't need to preach this way to them. You don't need to talk to them this way. You don't need to tell them these things. This is the truth. This is the reality. Jesus did not die on Calvary to make my life better. He died on Calvary for the glory of God. Now as a byproduct, my life becomes better. Thank God for it. But when I look at that event, this is something I've been saying in all the services that I've been preaching lately because it's just true. When I look at the cost... When I look at the event of Calvary, I'm not just putting my faith in Jesus to get something from him. I'm putting my faith in him and what he did at Calvary because he deserves it. Because at Calvary, he earned it. Because by breaking his body for me, by shedding his blood for me, he said, I deserve every single human being on this earth. I'm not just looking to get something from God to make my life more easy or better. I just want Him to take me. Have me. And I want Him to take you and to have you, to have all of you, not part of you. Because He paid for all of you. Every bit of you He paid for. Every friend you have. Every place you go. Every wrong thing you're keeping around, he paid to deliver you from that. What a price. Lord, take my life. And that's what he's saying in this gospel, in the gospel of Mark. That's his story. I am the one who has come to deliver humanity, and my path will be one of suffering and sacrifice in service to you. Follow me. Follow me. Follow me, follow me, follow me, follow me, follow Jesus. Give your life to him. What are you, Jesus said, what will you gain if you don't? The world? It's temporary, but your soul, eternal. The reward that you stand to gain is eternal life. Not only in the one to come, but you get to experience that new life today. He's given us an earnest of the Spirit, a down payment, a representation of what you get to have when you get there. Man, if 10% is this good, I can't wait for 100. I can't wait to see that full price deposited into my account. (laughs) been given an earnest. I'm already experiencing this new life. You've experienced the new life if you've given your life to Jesus. But there's more. There's so much more for you to have tonight in Christ. But it does require that you lay your life down. And Him rising from the dead, 
validates that that is what he's asking of us. He's not just wanting to save you. He wants you. He doesn't just want to deliver you from sin, and he does. He wants you. He doesn't just want to see you having the right friends and and making the right decisions and doing the right things, although he certainly does. What God wants is you. That's the price he paid. That's what he paid for was you. All of you. Not part of you. Every part of you. What a price. The only appropriate response is what Paul said in Romans chapter 12. Present your bodies unto him as a living sacrifice as those alive from the dead. This is the reason. He called it reasonable worship. Singers and musicians, you can come back. He referred to this as reasonable worship. You know, we come in here, and I've said this before, but it's worth saying again. We come in here, and we lift our hands, and we sing the songs. We show up at church. We put in a couple of hours like everybody's asking of us and expecting of us to do. We do all the things we're supposed to do so that we look good to everybody. And yet our heart, we've reserved to ourselves. We're not actually giving that to God. So everything you're doing, all of the worship, All of the lifting of hands, all of the singing, all of it, it's vanity. It's vanity because we're not giving him our heart. We're not giving him our life. We're not worshiping him. This place will change when we start giving our entire lives to Christ. We'll come in here, man, and nobody will have to try to pull praise out of us. Nobody will have to try to pull worship out of us. We'll come in here, and this place won't be able to go through its normal routines because worship will just be flowing out of us. Oh, hear me tonight. If we'll come and lay our lives down the way that he deserves, this place is going to erupt. Your lives will change. Your families will change. Your future will change. But it's a much better future. He who loses his life, that man will find it. Stand to your feet tonight. This is what I'm going to ask. Is there anybody in here that's ready to give some more to Jesus? Is there anybody in this place that's ready to relinquish control of things you've been trying to hold on to and give some more to him? All right, because he's asking. He's de- you know, let me I'll just say this. The Holy Spirit is dealing with something. As I've been talking, he, it, it's impossible for it not to be happening. I know what's happening in this place. I used to sit there. I know what it's like to sit there and hey, I got to study this text before I preach it. So I know what he's requiring of me. I know he's dealing with you. I know he's dealing with you. Those by television, listening by the radio, watching by the internet, I know the Holy Spirit is dealing with you tonight. I want everyone in this room to know Jesus loves you so much. This is why he did what he did at Calvary. He loves you with all of his heart. It's why he died. And all he's asking is for you in return to pour your love out on him. And that's all that I'm going to ask you to do tonight. Just come to these altars for a few minutes and pour your life out on Him. Pour your love out on Him. These altars are open.